Okay, um, so uh, let's discuss uh, topics for today. Um, I had uh, two suggestions. Um, the uh, 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 Michael has been uh, doing a lot of uh, good work actually implementing uh, modules in a way that can work safely on top of the shim uh, by rewrite uh, uh, according to you know, starting from something that I had sketched out uh, was previously talking about the, you know, where I'd previously talked about the sketch of these meetings but Michael's making it all real um, and uh, the other thing is I gave two talks at the recent TC39 meeting. Uh, one was basically a status update on SES, so that's uh, directly relevant. Uh, some of you were there and saw it, uh, some of you weren't. Um, and uh, the recording that I made of it uh, is fairly unwatchable because of my umming problem. So for a lot of reasons I was thinking um, that might be a good thing to represent to this group as well. A disarmed version. I'm sorry. You want to produce a disarmed version. Disarmed version. Yes. Yes. And uh, any other suggestions of what to talk about today? Uh, oh, well, uh, d just, just. Uh, I, I think. Um, yeah, a bit more TC thirty nine postmortem. Um, um, particularly, you, you mentioned your uh, CES update presentation, but we also had the uh, the in fix bang eventual send oh, yeah. a proposal, which which had an interesting uh, denouement. Uh, I think I think it was it really was just I mean for stage one, uh, I think the only real problem was simply that we didn't explain it enough for people to actually understand what the proposal means. Um, uh, there was a lot of objections raised uh, or, or issues, things people were uncomfortable with that will certainly be an issue for stage two. Um, uh, and it's certainly something to uh, represent to this group. Uh, it'd be wonderful to represent that. The recorded form in that one is also uh, trashed with ums. Uh, so yeah, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we should formulate a strategy for uh, circling back to, um, well, not exactly a, an FAQ, there's frequently answered questions, but more of a frequently raised objections um, uh, section. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the, well, what about X or why don't you do Y kind of, of, of things that people seem to raise repeatedly. Um, I think it would be good to address those in the document, but I think it would also be good to circle around to the particular people who were most vocal about those things and both um, see if more direct uh, uh, communication can, can uh, bring, bring them around to our way of thinking and in any case get a deeper read on what it is their, their objections are, are rooted in. Um, I mean, there's, there's things like Waldemar's sort of general pushback of, of, well, I don't understand this well enough yet, which is, which is fine. Um, uh, but the, the more of, well, well, isn't this just a fluid interface? Uh, people right. need a, a, a more... Why, can't, why do you need new syntax? Why can't you just do it with proxies? Right. Uh, do, all, do all promises need new methods rather than just some new promise, some new remote promise or handle promise class? Um, uh, so there's, there's, a, there's, um, so yes, I completely agree. Uh, Chip, are you volunteering to uh, start that part of uh, our documentation? Uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose I am. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so Michael, would you like to... Uh, take us into the modules. Sure. Yeah. So uh, just a bit of setting of expectations first. Um, what is happening right now is I'm actually in the process of working on this. So it's not something that is yet useful to anybody uh, except for passing a couple of test cases. Um, but let me see if I can do this. Okay. 
Okay, so um, just to give some context, uh, recently we landed some changes to Realm Shim that enable source transforms to be run before an evaluation takes place. Um, I experimented with that with transform bang. Uh, I'll show you what transform module looks like. Um, first, let me start. I'll start with the simpler transform bang and show you what a transform looks like. So a, a transform is passed into constructing the realm uh, and it has an optional rewrite method. Uh, and the transform bang essentially only does rewriting. So the second thing that it does have is um, as an endow method that is called uh, to add endowments to something or remove them before the transform source code runs. So um, we have this transform module. Uh, this is some source code that Mark worked on that is essentially taking this module source and rewriting it into uh, a set of different data structures that describe it, as well as a functor that is the same meaning of the module source, but actually invokes these hidden symbols to uh, link and uh, evaluate the modules that are joined with it. Uh, if it's simple, can you uh, suppress the... Um, the underlines? Yeah. 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 If it's not simple, then... <laughs> not simple. Um, I could show the other part. I'll go to the test case so that you can see. Um, so this module transformer is exactly what's uh, created. And we, we pass it essentially something that obeys the Babel rewriter interface. Um, and then we call make evaluators, which is somewhat equivalent to, to creating a realm with evaluators, except this one just works in regular JavaScript. Um, and then these are what the test cases look like. So we evaluate the import expression as just a plain expression or a program. And we supply a loader as an option. And we expect to get back a value that resolves from the promises returned. So uh, that's kind of the sanity test and exporting name things. We're evaluating module text here, especially. And uh, it runs some exports. And we expect to see that that returns a promise for the module namespace that we get back here as the result. Okay. Let me just double check. Um, uh, if anybody feels like they don't have enough context uh, to follow, uh, it'd be good to ask uh, for more context uh, early. So, um, uh, does everybody understand uh, what it is we're trying to do here? And uh, I, 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 I believe I understand the objective, but I don't understand the the path. This is a this is another Babel transform. Uh, yes. Yeah. So in this case transforms pass to realms or to a Gorg evaluate don't have to necessarily be Babel transforms, but they can uh, use a rewriter such as Babel. Uh, so this, the module transforms module um, or transform module creates something that conforms to that API that realm shim will have uh, and rewrite source code like this, the, the module expressions, or the module source code into something that actually evaluates. And then when it returns, uh, it performs the same thing as if we had module support in the language. Right, so, the, so some of the goals here are that 
um, the realm shim uh, security mechanism only understands valuable strings, doesn't understand modules. Um, uh, it's part of the reason for high confidence uh, uh, is that it does not depend on the correctness of the parser. Uh, so when we introduce modules, we want to do it in a layered way, where we turn the modules into valuable strings that we can hand, hand to the lower layer uh, so, that we part, so that we separate the risk. Um, and the other so the, the piece of this story, which I don't quite follow, is um, the, the ES module uh, design is, is intended to support um, uh, static analysis of the, of the, of the module hierarchy. Yep. And this looks like it requires the evaluation um, of the module, so which might not be static. Yet. Good, that's an excellent question. Uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that is an a important constraint on the design of this, is that uh, it, we transform the modules into strings where um, uh, we, the actual evaluation of the module body does not happen. Of, 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 you know, the, the, the evaluation of what of the effects that the user was was thinking in terms of was thinking what the module was saying would happen when the module was evaluated. All of that evaluation uh, is postponed until the entire graph of imports is all resolved. You have all the modules linked together. So, uh, so part of the game here is how to transform the modules separately into um, uh, uh, evaluable strings and records of the valuable strings uh, or, you know, um, and to be able to feed that into logic that can control the import namespace and with control of the import namespace bring about a wiring of those things together that satisfy all the imports. And then once you've got a graph with all the imports satisfied, then um, uh, we invoke, I forget what it's called. Initialize. Initialize. Yeah. And you invoke that once in kind of the root module, the, the, the thing that you imported from the outside uh, using like an import expression, um, uh, which we, by the way, we don't have import expressions translating it. Um, but the thing that you invoke from the outside that, uh, that in turn invokes internally the, the initialize hook of, of all of the other modules in that graph um, so that the effects of the top level module code, none of those effects happen until after the whole graph is loaded. I see. So, 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 so an, another way to explain that, I believe if I, got it correctly, and I'm not 100% sure I do, but I think I might, uh, is it's, it's, it's not for nothing that this function is called evaluate module, um, in that it's evaluate module, not evaluate. That's right. So you, you specify the parse target of, this is something we'll be introducing to Realm Shim, where we want to say, are you evaluating an expression, a script target, or a module target? And uh, a module target is not directly built into Realm Shim, but with this layering, Realm Shim can implement the back end for it. Okay. Yeah. So, and the, the, the key, of course, is what we translate import and export into um, that's part of the, the, the non module ECMAScript language. Uh, and that includes pr pr producing, in some sense, the metadata. Um, uh, that describes the modules we're linking together adequate so that um, uh, uh, so that it's the equivalent of a loader operating outside these modules has the metadata uh, that result from the parsing so that it knows what the imports and exports are that it needs to be hooking together. Right. So, 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 so the result of evaluate module is a module 
or a, a module namespace, a promise it, for a module namespace. Right. It's it's in effect a a a, a well a loaded module or a prom yeah promise for uh, a loaded module which is represented by its namespace and not the the consequence of actually executing all of the statements and expressions which are in the module. Uh, okay. There's some. There's there's um, there's a missing distinction here that, that the evaluate module here, the fact that it's evaluating to a, um, you know, the, the export record, the, the module instance object that um, will have these values means that that's what's, what results from the end of the process we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's something lower layer that gives us the static module records that you would then apply the um, uh, the loader logic to to hook up uh, imports and exports. Is that my, yeah? Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. So there there are three phases that uh, three main phases at least. Uh, the first is the loader that actually loads the sources that are specified by imports or by import expressions. Um, then the linker that decides what all needs to be wired together in order to create the resulting graph. And then the evaluator is run on the kind of the consequence that starts it all off. Okay. So the evaluate is, uh, is, is internally bringing about all those steps. And that means that this evaluate module, like the other evaluators, is specific to a compartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going with the uh, XS design that uh, the, we also use the compartment uh, for um, having separate import namespaces. Effectively, there's, it's like there's a loader per compartment. So the evaluate module here would already be embodying a decision about what the import namespace is that it uses to, to resolve the imports? Uh, the import namespace, like what is actually when, when the this, specifier map? Well, yeah, yeah. When this module says yeah. import foo, what is it importing? Uh, that's that's controlled by the module map for this particular compartment or evaluation instance. Right. But how does this that is the it, it does an evaluate module encapsulate the module map, or is that provided as a argument to the to evaluate module? Um. So where we make the evaluators, this this is equivalent okay. to what the what the realm shim would be. Okay. We specify the transforms, and then we can specify options that indicate the loader or indicate how we map from module specifiers into absolute module specifiers. When you say module map, that sounds like it's a, a map, but the, isn't it actually a function? A mapper, yeah. Yeah, mapper, okay. Um, so at least there is a spec language in this from what WG that Node also adopted. Uh, the module map is this specific data structure being used. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, we don't, we do um, that Not the mapper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So this is an example of uh, calling a regular um, expression or program uh, parsing goal. So my eval is either evaluate expression or evaluate program, and we supply it with an import expression. So as the third argument to the evaluator, uh, which in Realm Shim is basically an options bag, you can supply defaults for this when you create uh, okay. an evaluator, or you can also supply them individually to an evaluator, much like you can endowments. Okay. okay. So this, this particular evaluation call has no endowments, and it specifies a loader that takes a module specifier and returns a promise for that module's base directory and what the text is. So as I said, to set expectations, we don't actually have it wired up to a, a reasonable example with actually loading off disk, but that's coming next. So um, can you give an example of um, 
for as simple a module as possible, a uh, what 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 it transforms to, what the output of the transform is. Sure. So that we can then see how the the transformed form has the information we need to do the logic, the the all the wiring logic around it. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, if it's possible, could you just do one that only has a single uh, declaration importing itself? Importing itself? Yeah. Um, you mean like a circular thing? Yes, just module A has an import A. Yeah, I don't have that yet. <laughs> okay. Um, simply because, as I said, this this is currently over only testing the, the certain exports tags. I haven't okay. done the rewriting for imports except for import expressions. Oh, oh, okay. um, but yeah, that, yeah, I, I would love to do that and maybe by next week we can have that running for you. <laughs> okay. Um, Showing actually the rewrite. Uh, let's see here. We are generating a record with the metadata. Uh, yes. Um, so this should work. Uh, so, this is a typical module. Um, so, what is the module? What is the module source? The oh, module source code. I'll print that too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so this example was. Uh, what what is the module source? Code? The source code is right here. So this is an import oh, okay. foo specifically, oh, okay. and that transforms to a hidden symbol that does the import. Um, a simple export default foo transforms to h once default foo, uh, and this is what the the module functors look like. So that that transformation happens, and then it's embedded in a a function body that actually receives imports once in live as an instance for that, uh, or as, as essentially hooks for that module to call so that it can declare that it has no imports. And then it evaluates saying we're binding once the default export to foo. So that's the transformation of export default foo into the function functor. Okay, so the output is the, uh, the record um, no, the, the output's not the functor, it includes the metadata. Yeah, I, I could print the metadata too. I mean, the actual output string is, a, is an object expression, which is the record with the metadata. Yeah, well, the metadata I don't have it immediately available. Okay. Um, create. Life coding is always so much fun to watch. So this is what the, the metadata looks like, which Mark has called the module static record. Okay. So, um, that, so that string that's highlighted 
Uh, that's the evaluable strength that uh, is um, the, the, the main thing that's uh, then fed into the um, uh, eval. Uh, which, which, which string? Well, the, the string so, that Michael had just highlighted from, meta, from the, the open curly following module metadata open curly. So module source is the input source. Uh, then it provides the data structures for imports, what it actually imports. The live export map for which are live exports that we're doing. And the fixed exports for things that are, are constants. Um, and then the functor source is the rewritten version of that. And then the functor source itself being in the record as a string, uh, it then uh, gets evaluated you know, after evaluating the outer string, which is the record, uh, there's then a, a later step uh, where the, the uh, functor source is evaluated. And the reason why it's a later step is we're, do, we're going to evaluate that in a constructed scope so that so that, the, um, so that, that function uh, is in a scope that we control. Um, uh, um, uh, some of the constraints here is that uh, the, we want to be able to compile the modules separately where, where we're not doing any cross module analysis to figure out what the output of the transform is. So uh, a module that's exporting something always knows if it's exporting, if it's the initial exporting, exporter of the thing, uh, it knows whether it's a live binding. Uh, because if there is no assignment inside that module source code to the same identifier, uh, then it is not a live binding. Uh, if there is an assignment, then it is a live binding. Um, uh, the other uh, exporting thing, exporting case, is you can import and re-export something, in which case you yourself cannot assign to it, um, because anything you import, you get at most a read-only view. Uh, but in that case, we make a conservative assumption that it's a live binding. Uh, the importer has no idea whether what it's importing is a live binding or not. So the, so the, the imports record here uh, doesn't distinguish live or not, uh, but the exports do. Um, and uh, the, result, the, cons the resulting constraint is that we need to uh, compile in such a way that uh, the typical case where the, the um, where there is not a live binding, all of this compiles to something that has the normal efficiency properties you would expect, but where the um, uh, the transformed representation of an import uh, also works for the live binding case, since the importer has no idea whether it's live or not. So, because of line numbers, this kind of gets broken up. There's all these things in the first line are uh, the preamble for the, this whole module. And then the first line continues with live ABC, which corresponds to this rewritten statement, let ABC equals one, two, three. So it's not smart enough to identify that it's not assigned to, so it just assumes that it's live. Um, and then the second line, DEF. Uh, okay, I was, I was missing the fact that you've got a, 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 a a dot followed by a new line in one string concatenated with another string. So that's actually, you know, H dollar alive dot def 456. I was trying to figure out how def got associated with the, yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Exactly. So one thing, uh, just looking at this, uh, do you do the function hoisting for hoistable declarations? I know they're available before module uh, evaluation begins. So ask the question again. Uh, if you export a function with the function keyword, um, it is available prior to a module evaluating. You might uh, need to separate that out if you're going to want to support that. Put the functions on the top level and then export their value specifically? Uh, yes. So they're uh, allocated prior to the module beginning its evaluation phase. Is there a observable difference between saying it's available before versus 
saying that they're made available first. In other words, if we, if we simply, you know, hypothetically, if we had simply manually hoisted uh, all of those top level function declarations to the beginning of the text of the module, uh, and would that be observably equivalent to the special case for functions? Uh, with top level await and cycles, it's observable. Okay. So my, my understanding is we still leave the function declaration on the same line, but it wouldn't be the argument to the, the H live or H once directly because that would prevent the name from being bound. It's my understanding. Uh, let's see the, okay, let's take, let's take a look at the uh, translation of ABC. And you're saying that ABC is treated as live because we don't yet have the analysis to notice the absence of an assignment. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. okay. So, so obviously, typically, a function would not be live, but let's ne nevertheless let's trace through this case. So let's say we just treated a, since ABC comes first, let's say we just treated it like we're treating ABC. So we're calling dollar H, right, 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 right. We're calling dollar H live of ABC with the initializer at the position where that corresponds to where the declaration was, which is correct for let because we put the expression that it should be initialized to uh, between the parens. Uh, the binding is live uh, in the sense of, of um, import export bindings before we call the dollar H live. Um, uh, which is only observable in cycles, but it is it should be linked together before that's called to give it an initial value. Um, it's so if we called H live for functions, if we called it not at the position of the function declaration, but rather called it at the top left the function declaration where it is in the file for the purpose of preserving close as possible to the original source code structure, but, but uh, the name is already in scope at the top, of course. Um, uh, that would take us closer. Um, Yeah, I can't think through yet what our representation would actually do in a cycle. We also do not yet support top level await. So uh, Bradley, I think the answer to your question is, um, in the absence of cycles and top level await, we're still not yet doing the right thing, but we, but we can get- It's not observable. Right. It's, it's, it, um, it, uh, so, um, uh, so really working through the cycle case and making sure that we're correct in that case uh, is, um, I think, still most in front of us. You haven't tried to, Michael, have you tried to think through a cycle of any sort yet? No, not yet. Okay. So me neither. I, I don't have imports yet, except for expressions. Okay. Um, what, I, is the, what is the consequence of observability? Uh, so we want the result of this to as closely as possible implement the ECMAScript specified semantics for modules. And there's already one way in which we knowingly violate that spec, uh, which is um, uh, a temporal dead zone for the importer. Uh, for the original exporter, the temporal dead zone is exactly what it should be uh, because the we're not moving the declaration. Uh, the, um, I'm sorry, for, a, for, for the original exporter of a non-live binding, for, for a fixed binding, uh, the temporal dead zone is exactly what, you would ex what it should be. Um, for a 
for the importer uh, in a cycle, the importer, if it accesses the variable before the exporter had initialized it, then it should get a reference error because of temporal dead zone. And instead, um, what the other constraints on this design forced us into is we lose that compatibility. Instead, if you access it before it's initialized, you just get undefined. So my question is, is slightly different. I, I understand the goal of attempting to cue to the spec to the maximum extent possible. And, and indeed, I, I, I agree with that. I support that. Um, my question is, what is the effective consequence of this little extra bit of observability? What, what, what does that expose us to? What, what is the incompatibility risk? Um, you know, what, what? So the incompatibility risk uh, for the particular incompatibility I just stated uh, is uh, 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 based on prior experience with what kinds of changes to ECMAScript broke the web and which ones didn't. I say the incompatibility risk here is almost zero because the spec requires an error and we deviate from the spec by uh, turning an error case into a non-error case. Um, uh, the, the, the potential problem there uh, isn't so much a, well, is, is only indirectly a compatibility problem. I don't know if, even know if you want to call it that. The potential problem is if someone is developing, going around their development loop purely in our system, uh, before it encounters other implementations of ECMAScript modules, they might write something that doesn't provoke the error when it should have provoked the error. And then when they take that and run it under a correct ECMAScript module system, they'll get the error. But that's really a compatibility risk in the other direction. Right. That actually would consider that to be fairly serious. But um, the question is how... How, how there there are things where you actually have to jump through some fairly complicated hoops to get yourself into the problematic situation, and there are others where you just might naturally do that as a course of, you know, ordinary programming behavior. And I don't understand this well enough to to see which of those two buckets this falls into. So the key so, that Bradley is raising of some um, imports with functions. Okay, Bradley, you want to talk this here? Yes, so there's only one known valid use case that's in the wild that I've seen in trying to figure out this. Uh, and it's the only way that you can actually create friend modules currently, uh, where you can have two uh, modules have their first static import be each other. And then you can immediately cause them to essentially, in their first line of evaluation, um, bind themselves to each other and delete the ability to create friends afterwards. Do you have an do you have an example code of this that you could uh, use? it's it's a couple years back on ES Discuss. I think it was called the gate yeah the gateway uh pattern. Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't recall this at all. It's it's very rare, but there are a few in instances uh, and, and why do people find it useful? What, 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 is, the, what is the motivation for it? Uh, you can split up modules sharing private state. Ah, 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 ah. Okay. So um, that's it's actually of, uh, of, of a lot of relevance to, to this group. Yeah. I don't remember it off the top of my head, the exact search term. Okay. So another time, or if you find it, you know, after the meeting, just send email. Sure. In reality, I think it's minor. Um, these people can always just combine their modules. It's convenience. Okay. So when we do find it, we can always just add it as you know, 
test test out our design once it's otherwise working and see how it fails on that case. Um, and then uh, the other uh, missing feature uh, is uh, top level of weight. And uh, uh, so let me, so I haven't thought about this much. So let me uh, just mention a hypothesis to investigate, uh, which is, um, if that outer functor, the module functor, um, uh, is turned from a function into an async function, then the top level of weights just continue to be a weights in, in that body. And uh, what else is needed to support top level of weight? There's a, there's, I think, I think I must be missing a lot. Oh, so top level weights have the ability to cause only sibling modules to evaluate at the same uh, time as you effectively. They block other modules from evaluating and extend their dead zone. Oh. And so that extended dead zone makes it observable as well. Right, we're not, yes, so, so, so the transform that I said wouldn't work at all because it would still insist on linking the full transitive graph up front, not paying attention to uh, the, the phasing. So top level of weight will, will definitely be a whole nother level of trickiness to support. I don't think it's as hard as it sounds. It is mostly organizing um, and figuring out when modules have finished evaluating. If you can traverse your graph and create uh, groupings of sibling modules uh, at each depth, uh, you essentially would be playing out your graph and how it would evaluate, which is post-order traversal. So siblings in post-order traversal would effectively have a promise dot all around them waiting for their evaluation phase to end. And this would all be compatible with having the compilation to this record form still do no cross-module analysis being correct for compilation. And then all of the cross-module analysis is in terms of loading logic, looking at this metadata but the metadata would have to be basically this kind of metadata per phase. Is that correct? Correct. You do not need to analyze source code. Okay. Okay. But we need, we need metadata per phase. And since the weight is top level, uh, the, there are explicit phases. I think I didn't follow that. Um, top level await. Well, I guess I don't understand top level await. Um, and I was trying to formulate a question and I'm realizing. So due to uh, complaints, top level await does not act like await within an async function. Um, in particular, people were worried about creating blocking sections of module graphs. Uh, right. So essentially what top level await it does is it creates a blocking, but it only blocks your uh, dependent modules from evaluating. It doesn't block your children or your siblings from evaluating. Um, so what happens effectively is if we have a root module A, which has two dependencies B and C, and they can have however many dependencies under them, um, B and C interleave their awaits at the top level before A evaluates. And so with B and C interleaving awaits, they can actually access each other uh, even with dynamic import eagerly huh. before they're finished constructing. Okay, this is definitely weirder than I understand. Yeah, that is very weird. Um, I would agree. I did not want that, but that's, that's what we're doing. Is there a known 
transformation of modules with top level of weight into modules without top level of weight? Uh, I do not believe it's possible without control over the loader. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that was, yeah, that was sort of my question was regular weights can be expressed as um, a, a desugaring, whereas top level weight, it feels like you need to be in cahoots with the engine. Correct. Okay. Okay. So at some point, our transform here will need to deal with top level weight. It's, 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 it's not something we can postpone to yet another layer uh, for this reason. Um, but <clears throat> right, since it's a very new feature, uh, the vast, vast majority of code we're interested in right now doesn't have top level of weight. Uh, so where, where is top level of weight in, in the, um, in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the, in the stage process? It is stage three, I believe now. Okay. Which means I can double check. But. Yeah, if stage three means that these two browsers are already shipping it. Right. I, I was just mildly com, 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 uh, curious, but. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, it's stage three. Okay. So, um, so it should be the case that um, top level weight, um, the, uh, the time at which functions are bound, um, and the absence of temporal dead zone on imports, um, that uh, those things should be the only incompatibilities <clears throat> between what we're trying to do here and the standard, while at the same time, this representation should give us complete control without, for, without further parsing, uh, complete control off of the wiring <clears throat> and the, you know, the, the re resolution of import namespaces for hooking these things up to each other, um, uh, as well as um, uh, for providing you know, which 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 global and endowments do we provide to which module uh, is also uh, under our control, which is why the functor source is a separate string um, rather than just including the function there. And uh, the other, the, the other uh, since ABC uh, is here an example of a um, live binding, uh, and GHI is an example of a fixed binding, uh, I can point out some of the differences, uh, which is um, GHI, I'm confused, uh, there's no declaration. Of GHI. That's correct. Uh, uh, it's because it's in the fixed exports map, so it gets put on the, the proxy that evaluates it. No, that should only be the live, the, the live exports. Fixed export behaves similarly. Mm, oh, no. wait, just a second. Fixed exports are never assigned to. Okay. Um, and uh, they should be declared, and then you get all the local, the correct local temporal dead zone, as well as the efficiency of not going through the proxy. Okay, that's yeah. not how the. Yeah, and that's why um, uh, the once actually uh, returns the value so that you can have a declaration to the left of it. Whereas the, the, you know, the, the, the dollar h once dot ghi. That's okay. 786, 789 returns 789. So you can have a okay. const GHI equals to the left of it. Uh, whereas um, the live binding um, initializes ABC, but it never declares ABC. Right. 
And the reason is that- It needs to proxy trap. Yeah, we use the proxy trick, the width on a proxy trick um, uh, in order to uh, pr bring ABC into scope in such a way that we can trap assignments. It's the only way uh, without rewriting an assignment to ABC uh, to uh, trap an assignment to ABC so that we can update all the importers to have the same value. Um, uh, so that's the trick here is that only the live bindings have the proxy overhead. Uh, everything else has just the, the normal overheads you would expect. Uh, and even the um, locally, the um, uh, temporal dead zone you'd expect. Uh, the other constraint, which we're meeting so far, except for import expressions again, uh, the other constraint that we're meeting is that we're not rewriting the text within functions at all. And, uh, and that includes classes. Cla the source code of classes and the source code of functions um, uh, is completely unmodified. Uh, that's why we can't rewrite the assignments. We have mm -hmm. to rewrite the top, the, the outer declarations. Okay. Yeah, I missed that in okay. the const, so. Okay. Right, so the three arguments to the module factor, um, uh, the h dot live and the h dot once, are for live and fixed bindings respectively. And each of those is a record from the respective variable names to a one argument function of the initial value to uh, re respectively uh, update or initialize it to. Um, uh, the uh, $h imports is more interesting, but since that's not yet implemented, uh, we don't know, um, we should probably just postpone that till, till another session. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, but then the, the information we've extracted into the metadata uh, should be adequate for doing all of the wiring and for verifying that you have no unresolved imports. Okay. Yeah, thanks everybody for your feedback. Um, as I said, this is preliminary, but uh, we hope to give more updates as time goes on too. Yeah, it's it's great to see this take shape. I'm very impressed, actually. The 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 degree to which the sort of reflexiveness is possible in JavaScript continues to amaze me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and by the way, just um, in case it didn't stand out, the Babel trick here that I didn't know about until Michael told me about it. Where it preserves line, it preserves the line boundaries. Um, that uh, after the header information, the other things, the lines in the source code correspond one for one to the lines in the transform source code. Well, you mean uh, um, oh, the the header meaning the 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 preamble, yeah, preamble. That, that preamble, right. Not the header of the code being transformed, but the, the header that adds up being packed onto the output of the transformation. That's right. Right. And so you can, you can correct, if you have any debug metadata, it's all a fixed offset to make everything be correct. Yep. So Very good. On source maps for now. Source maps, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we want, we want it to you know, generate, I mean, Babel already generates full source maps. So if you're in an environment that can take advantage of that, that's great. Um, uh, the wonderful thing about this line number preservation is that it's, we can create a non-terrible experience uh, in things that don't have source maps working. Right. Yeah, I've, I've uh found myself in such situations on occasion, and uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I can go into my two talks. Uh, oh, I should 
pre I need to present it first. Let me toss it first. Uh, I'm, I'm, I should be, oh, am I muted? Oh, I'm muted. No, I should, I, I, I didn't join audio. I shouldn't be a source of sound. Okay. I don't know what that was. Okay. Okay, but I need to share screen. So the entire screen is fine. Okay. Uh, and Bradley, you were attending TC39 remote. Did you see these presentations? Yes. Okay, great. It's not sharing. Oh, it's not sharing. Uh, maybe because it's full screen. Huh. I need to point to it first before you can get there. Try going it's back still to not your, sharing. your Zoom thing. What? Try going back to your Zoom thing. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then share again. Application window. Okay, but then I won't be able to go full screen if I do the application window. You should be able to do that one. Okay, let's see. Uh, wow, it's already not sharing. Hmm. Oh, I do not. Um, You want to see if you can present it? You have a Mac. You have Keynote? Yeah, I do. Okay. Can you send it to me, Zara? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what is your plan here? Uh, we're going to present from Michael's laptop, which is also a Mac and has Keynote installed. Uh, that was not actually the question I was asking. Oh. You're presenting your TC39 pre presentation or you're playing back the recording of the TC39 presentation? Not playing back the recording. So you're, you're just attempting to do the presentation again in a cleaner form? Right. Okay. And, and interactively this time. So okay. that, uh, the uh, recorded presentation um, will be more of a discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, I should just, just alert you. I'm going to have to leave in about 10 minutes. Um, um, uh, have to take Janice to the knee doctor. Um, and uh, so if you're in the middle of, of, of this, I will just drop out uh, without interrupting the flow. Okay. Uh, 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 Chip, you were there. Uh, anything you want to say about, anything more you want to say about um, uh, TC39 before you take off? Um, I thought the, the, the the overall um, uh, well, first of all, there's there 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 are two parts to your 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 presentation. One is the uh, eventual send stuff, and the other is the assess status update. Uh, I thought the status update was um, uh, well received. Um, I think people are. I get the sense that people are kind of now thinking of this as a thing that is coming. Um, um, I think that people who have been uh, 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 resistant are, you know, have managed to compartmentalize uh, enough that, 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 that we're okay. I think, um, I think the overall explication of what we're about could probably be, be better, but that was already a group which was very contexted to begin with. Um, I think the emphasis on the um, diversity of uh, uh, environments in which code can run beyond just the browser, uh, I think that's a really important point. I think we need to be hammering on that more, um, uh, particularly amongst the folks who think that the web is all there is, um, without naming names. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but on the whole, I think the, the, the SES effort is, is um, I think was was well well represented by that that presentation. I think the um, the eventual send 
um, thing didn't go quite as well. And I think all of the issues that we've, we've identified, I think it was a very good diagnostic uh, 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 exercise in terms of identifying the places where we want to uh, shore up or clarify or expand on um, what we've got. Um, I think the offline uh, uh, socialization of the infix bang stuff um, uh, outside the context of the formal presentation um, was extraordinarily well uh, uh, done and and um, I think well received by the, the, the you know there's a little bit of self selection on the audience there because you were talking to people who were uh, predisposed to be interested in it. Uh, uh, nevertheless, there were a number of people who hadn't had no, um, um, you really no familiarity with the idea at all, and you were able to, you were able to, um, you know, answer their questions about, well, what about this, what about that, um, pretty effectively, I thought, and we need to fold that back into our, um, our overall pitch. Okay. I, I think just in general, this stuff. Uh, this stuff seems to seems to sell better in sort of more intimate presentations than in a, in a plenary session. Um, so I think we probably want to be doing more of that to be recruiting more of the committee to our cause. Good, good. That's really good feedback. Okay. So um, I started off by saying that this is a status update, not a request to advance uh, through the staging process. And that uh, the presentation will explain why we're not asking for advancement. But uh, in the absence of advancement, it's, it's easy to think that nothing's happening. And in fact, um, a significant number of uh, people and groups on the committee uh, have been working together on this and a lot has been happening. So this is bringing you up to date uh, on what's been happening and how we're thinking about the boundaries between the proposals have changed. The preceding presentation was by a uh, Kumavis of MetaMask. Uh, I thought that was a really great presentation, by the way, uh, where uh, he was talking about uh, the things that MetaMask is doing to incorporate FCS uh, to make MetaMask itself safer and the extent to which their problems are not in any way MetaMask specific, but are, are general across the ecosystem. And this was, this is a graph uh, from Kumavis of the package dependency graph that make up MetaMask. And what we see here is representative of a tremendous number of applications out uh, in the world. Uh, NPM, uh, NPM estimates that of the typical JavaScript application, about 3% of the code is specific to the application, is written by the group creating the application. And the remaining 97% of the code are libraries written by third parties that are linked in. And under JavaScript as it is today, any one of those libraries can completely corrupt the application. In the context of MetaMask, since MetaMask is the primary user interface framework for creating user interfaces to decentralized applications, to applications running on blockchain, any one of the packages linked in could not only corrupt the user interface, but all of the assets that that person is using through the user interface, the malicious library can steal all of those assets. So the exposure here, the risk exposure is really uh, quite frightening. So what uh, Sessify is doing, their Browserify plugin, 
is that it's doing a, first of all, it's doing a tofu analysis. Uh, that's a tofu that Kumavis wrote based on the tofu that Bradley wrote. Uh, he's taking a look at what each module apparently depends on by this uh, naive static analysis, uh, creating a configuration file uh, that records those apparent dependencies. And then in spawning these things under SES, we're spawning them such that the authority we're giving them, the initial authority we're giving them, is only the authority that we think they need based on this naive static analysis. So if they're, if they're trying to, in some sneaky way, gain authority that they weren't naively obtaining, authority that wasn't revealed through the uh, naive static analysis, anything sneaky they're doing to obtain more initial authority should be blocked by SES. So the coloring here is uh, the degree of danger that these different modules represent based on what things they're dependent on. Uh, something that's shown as green is basically not dependent on anything that we've flagged as unsafe, uh, like access to the network or direct access to a DOM node. Uh, uh, this red thing over here, we mouse over it and we see what it apparently depends on, both its globals and its, um, the modules that it imports. And we see that one of the globals that it depends on is XML HTTP request. So in order to run that module, you have to run it in an environment in which there is a global named XML HTTP request and in which that global acts enough like the XML HTTP request that it's expecting uh, as to enable that module to run. So any security review of these things would start with the red nodes and proceed down in colors towards the green. And for these dangerous imports, you can also take a look at what the module actually does with them and figure out whether you want to manually impose, interpose an attenuator. Uh, if this thing is only doing a few things with XML HTTP request, if it seems, for example, to only be accessing pages at a given host, uh, you could attenuate it uh, so that it only can access pages at that host, uh, things like that. Um, the, the main thing is that uh, SES gives us this ability to constrain these modules initially to the uh, naively um, scraped authority uh, and then uh, under further maintenance according to some policy that somebody expresses uh, by manipulating this, this graph. So for those who haven't already, uh, aren't, are not already familiar with SES or the object capability perspective on JavaScript, and for people who think that JavaScript cannot be used as a secure or robust programming uh, language, I want to uh, offer this counterexample. Uh, we have a uh, function named make counter. This is using the object disclosure pattern. You can do essentially the same thing with the class pattern using private state and object freeze. Uh, but let's just do it. Uh, let's do this one. So you have an outer function make counter. And every time you call it, it makes a new object, which is this record with an inker and decker method that uh, lexically capture this, this encapsulated count variable. So every time we call it, we make a new triple of a uh, inker function, a decker function, an encapsulated count variable, and the record exposing the inker function and decker function. Uh, so that's basically the object. Uh, the harden is an abstraction over object.freeze. So the record itself cannot be um, tampered with. And every time we call it, we make a new instance where each of these instances is isolated from the other. Uh, with one of these, 
one of the things that you can do, what can you do with one of these counters with an anchor and a decker? Uh, you can, for example, if you want to uh, count the number of things entering and exiting a container, uh, you could have an entry guard guarding the entrance to the container, an exit guard guarding the exit to the container, and give the entry card the ability to increment and give the exit card the ability to decrement. And the intuition that a programmer should take to this, if they don't know the odd corners of JavaScript, what does this program seem to be doing? It seems to be giving the entry guard only the ability to, to increment and giving the exit guard only the ability to decrement. So the basic idea of SES is to uphold that expectation, to actually make it possible to only give the entry guard the ability to, to increment using the code pattern that you saw. The reason that JavaScript is a suitable language for creating this secure runtime, this secure SES runtime, and why the resulting SES system is really essentially just JavaScript as far as the experience that programmers have is because JavaScript is uniquely well set up uh, for carving out this object capability behavior, this object capability form of JavaScript from the language. Even going back to ECMAScript 3, which was the JavaScript that we had when, when I joined the committee, there was this accident of history where JavaScript, the language, was being standardized under ECMA. The browser was being standardized under W3C. And even though for the first decade of JavaScript's existence, the only host that mattered was the browser, this jurisdictional separation between two standards bodies prevented most browser concepts from leaking into the language definition and prevented all browser effects from leaking into the language definition. So the language itself was left as a language without IO, a language that essentially had no abilities to cause effects to the world outside of itself, but provided a means for hosts like the browser to provide that ability to cause effects by providing host objects like XML HTTP request and uh, uh, window and document and all the rest of it, uh, providing those host objects by populating the global address space. And then JavaScript objects could only get initial access to a host object by global scope lookup. So if you can intervene on the global scope lookup, you're in a position to virtualize the host essentially completely, virtualize all abilities to cause external effects, it's very much like how in a hardware architecture, when you have a clean separation between the user mode instruction set and the system mode instruction set, and all attempts to do system things cause traps, you can essentially virtualize any operating system on top of such a machine. So that gives us support for realms as a unit of isolation. JavaScript furthermore supports object granularity protection by virtue of the fact that each object, the only things it's born with implicit access to are the primordials. Like when you evaluate a open square bracket, closed square bracket, it's born inheriting from object from array.prototype. So there's all those things it has implicit access to, 
All of those things which we call the primor the collectively the primordials, the objects that exist before code starts running, have almost no hidden mutable state in them, meaning that almost all of their mutable state are in exposed properties. So if you transitively freeze them, if you freeze all of those objects and therefore lock down all of their properties, there's essentially no hidden state left. So the only things that objects implicitly have access to are not a, does not give them an ability to cause any effects. And therefore all of their abilities to cause effects on an object by object basis are based on what other objects they're explicitly given access to. So this is, I'm going to use this little sample of the primordials to just stand for the full set of primordials. So the primordials come in a self-contained graph. One of the things very nice about the primordials is they point at each other, but they don't point at anything outside the primordials. So traverse, traversing these pointers only takes you from primordial to primordial. And there's also the global object, which has these global property names, these property names that point at some of these primordials. And of the primordials, uh, there's a special category of primordial that we call the evaluators for which the global object serves a special role. In this picture, function and eval are evaluators and to evaluators, when they evaluate code for any name lookup, where it's, you're, you're looking up a variable name that's not defined within the code for any, free, that, uh, for any lookup of a free variable, it's looked up in the global scope and the global scope is essentially aliases the property names of the global object. So function and eval are evaluating code within the scope of this global object. The main thing CES is about is locking down all the primordials, freezing it, which is the, I'm indicating here with the uh, filled in uh, gray and dark colors. So all those objects are frozen and introduce a new abstraction, which is the compartment, where a compartment is a realm in the sense of an execution scope, an, uh, an execution context uh, for code to be running in. So each of these other boxes is, all, is, is a compartment, but a compartment differs from a full realm as we've known it in that it does not have its own set of primordials. It inherits the primordials from the full realm it's created in. So since these full realms are also realms, uh, we introduce terminology distinction. The full realm, we call it a root realm. And then the compartments are a, also a kind of realm, but they're a realm within a root realm. And each compartment only costs a few objects. And this ability to create featherweight uh, protection domains is in particular important to access the, uh, the embedded JavaScript uh, for devices with limited memory so we can have many featherweight compartments with very little space overhead per compartment. JavaScript exists in four primar primary hosting environments. Of course, it started in the browser. Also the single machine server, this, which we call the solo server. Embedded is also a widespread use of JavaScript, but it's not a well-known use of JavaScript. Uh, there are many devices that, that, including probably some in your house, that are actually uh, running an embedded JavaScript. 
And then of course, now blockchain is a new hosting environment. On the browser, Agoric and Salesforce collaborated together to create this, the uh, SES shim, which shims the proposal, but does it with real security. Uh, and this goes back to the SES that in, in an earlier generation was part of Google Kaha uh, during the ECMAScript five days, Agoric and Salesforce have reconstructed that functionality, taking full advantage of modern JavaScript and doing an SES for modern JavaScript. And Salesforce is running a 5 million developer ecosystem on their Lightning platform for which this SES shim is the security card. We've been working with some core node people, in particular, uh, Bradley uh, Farias and um, uh, Guy Bedford to bring direct support for elements of SES uh, into Node, uh, which I'll be explaining on the next, more on the next slide. The JavaScript for embedded devices uh, there's both XS, which I mentioned, and there's the new standards group under ECMA, TC53, which is standardizing the JavaScript modules for embedded devices. TC53 is explicitly using SES as the standard JavaScript for embedded devices, such that the standardization of all the modules for embedded assumes SES as the context of execution, and XS, which is the main JavaScript on embedded devices, uh, represented by Modable here on the committee, uh, they already have a configuration out of the box that's a full SES implementation. It's not a, sh it's not a uh, SES created by carving it out of a full JavaScript engine at runtime, it's rather a runtime which, which just has SES and omits the parts of JavaScript that are not in SES. And then of course, Agoric is bringing SES to the blockchain. And MetaMask is, as I mentioned, uh, has created a browserify plugin called uh, Sessify that is using Sess to do this uh, uh, safe module linkage. So our notion of what the proposals should be and what the boundaries between them are, what the relationships are, has been shifting. And that's a reason why we want to, to settle this down and complete the design more uh, before we, we take it for stage advancement, which hopefully we'll do very soon. But initially we were thinking in terms of a three layer system, realms on the bottom, then frozen realms, and then SES on top. Over time, elements of frozen realms move down into our notion of what the realms proposal should be, and elements of frozen realms moved up into what we considered SES to be, and it just, over time, it, there wasn't enough difference to justify three layers, it really collapsed into these two layers. And the realms layer was about both creating new root realms and creating new compartments within root realms. But what we realized over time, as we went to apply SES uh, to various systems, is that the use cases for creating root realms and the use cases for creating compartments were quite distinct. In particular, the embedded use with XS 
is an environment that is not able to create multiple root realms and in which there's no reason to do the engineering to enable multiple root realms. It really is quite naturally a single root realm environment. And likewise, in the browser, a worker is a single root realm environment. There's no ability to create multiple root realms within a worker, and there's not, mu not much reason uh, to change that. So we want to separate out the compartment support so that the compartment support is able to secure the root realm that it finds itself in and to create multiple compartments within that root realm without the assumption of creating new root realms. So we want these things more separated. Node has been making uh, great progress bringing elements of CES directly into Node uh, so that Node can provide more direct support for CES and CES-like security. So Node already comes with an experimental flag. It's already shipping with this experimental uh, frozen intrinsics flag that when turned on actually creates a instantiation of node in which in the main environment, all the, all the intrinsics, which is the primordials, are already born frozen. Uh, Bradley has been working on this uh, tofu static analyzer to extract from existing code an approximation of what authorities it initially depends on so that you can do the kind of analysis and constraint that we saw with, um, that I explained when I showed uh, Kumavis's graph. Node really has only three globals, which is, or, or I suppose four globals, process, array, buffer, and then require and module for, but the require and module with module.exports those are really just the common JS form of import and export. They're just the mechanism for, for importing and exporting among common JS modules. So the, the, the interesting things as global variables in Node is process and array buffer. And uh, Guy Bedford has been making uh, good progress on quarantining those so that they're not visible from ECMAScript standard modules. They're, they only remain visible from common JS modules so that we can deprecate them and hope to diminish their access over time. But whether we quarantine them that way or not, the compartment mechanism already gives us the ability to create compartments in which these are absent or virtualized. So we still have control over these, whether or not the platform gives us direct quarantining of it. There's work on a extensible control of the module loading system uh, for being able to remap and attenuate imports. And the main compatibility problem that you run into when you freeze the primordials is the override mistake. For example, if you create a new object in the context, in a context in which all the primordials are frozen and you want to give it a two string method by saying uh, object dot two string equals new function, if the primordials are naively frozen, that assignment will fail. Uh, because of a spec mistake that, that uh, the ECMAScript committee uh, made many years ago that we've failed to fix. However, there is a known workaround, which is for those properties to turn them from data properties into accessor properties, where the getter-setter behavior emulates what the behavior would have been 
for a frozen data property in the absence of the override mistake. Uh, and Guy Bedford has already gotten uh, that fix to the primordials uh, in for all of the primordial prototype objects, which is where, it's, where the problem practically arises. Uh, the experience at Salesforce uh, says that even more narrowly, uh, there are five of the primordial prototypes, uh, array, object, function. I don't remember what the other two are, uh, but if you uh, do this masking of the override mistake for the methods on those five prototypes, the problem practically goes away for most code. So these URLs take you to the interesting things that represent the current state of SES. The first link is the official link to the SES proposal, which, which is still at stage one. And I recommend that you don't look at it very hard because the text of that is way stale compared to our current understanding. It has not been revised in quite a long time. What's much more relevant is the second link, uh, which is the draft standalone SES spec. And what we mean by that is that the, the SES spec primarily had focused on the API for creating an SES environment starting from a full JavaScript environment. What we realized, especially because of the embedded case, is that the thing to specify first is what would be, what is the SES environment that results from creating an SES environment, however you create it. Get that pinned down first and then worry about the API for creating it. And that suits modable and embedded perfectly well because those machines can just start out as standalone SES machines without a prior JavaScript you have created it from. When we started off defining compartments as reflected in the graphics that you, that you saw, we were mostly focused on the behavior of the runtime evaluators like eval and function. And we had not yet pinned down what the actual semantics were for safe module loading and module linkage under SES. Uh, all the existing users of SES, um, Salesforce and MetaMask in particular, also Agoric, um, uh, all three of us were using existing packagers to turn modules into evaluable scripts so we can use our support for safe script evaluation, but we need a first class semantics for safe modules for SES. And this problem became more urgent with embedded because in embedded, the normal configuration has no runtime evaluators. You do all of your evaluation at build time, creating the system that you then put into ROM that then runs code at runtime. So Modable came up with our first compartment spec that has a system for module loading and import remapping and attenuation that they have implemented in the shipping Modable SES engine and which Agoric is now working on implementing as an extension of our own SES shim. And that's a safe module system that does not assume the existence of runtime evaluators, but is consistent with the existence of runtime evaluators uh, for, for, for the more conventional environments in which those would also be on a com per compartment basis. Uh, there's the shim itself, uh, which we're using. The locker service is the uh, system that Salesforce is using that I mentioned. 
Sassify is the system that MetaMask is using as a uh, pl plugin for Browserify. Uh, and the full Agoric system with smart contracting all built and running on blockchain, all sitting on top of Sass, is at, at the Cosmos Swing Set API. And now I'll take questions. Are you all still there? Yep, I'm still here. So um, you have pared down the proposal a lot. Uh, it sounds like uh, these are meant to be run on the same agent and potentially talking with each other. You didn't mention in your presentation the ability for compartments to create other compartments within themselves. Is that still being discussed? So compartments can create other compartments because there's this compartment, um, you know, this proposed new compartment global, which would just be one of the primordials, just, you know, you know a proposed new primordial alongside, uh, you know, date and regexp and all the other language global primordials. Uh, so it would be, in, so the compartment API would be in scope to all the compartments. So the compartments can create new compartments. Uh, there's no, there was never any sense in which when compartment A creates compartment B, there was never any sense in which uh, B is within A. B is fully under the control of A because A was, uh, use the compartment API to parameterize what the nature of B was, but structurally both A and B are just directly nested under the root realm that both of them are within. So there's no, there's no loss of flexibility with regard to any of those issues in the current proposal that I'm aware of. And realms and SES were never cross-agent. Uh, there was never any, any discussion in either realms or SES about multiple agents, where an agent is a unit of concurrency. Uh, it was always multi about multiple realms within one heap of objects. Sure. Uh, I mostly mentioned agents because you were talking about workers and things as realm. Uh, containers that are natural. Yes, uh, I wasn't thinking about uh, uh, realms or compartments having any bearing on how workers talk to each other, but rather on the ability to create uh, multiple protection domains uh, within a worker with even though there's no ability to create multiple root realms in a worker. We don't need to do the engineering to enable multiple root realms in a worker in order to, to divide a worker up into these multiple protection domains. And that was actually raised by MetaMask. Uh, MetaMask. Wants to be able to run Code in a worker in the browser where there's a separation of authority among the code running within one worker. Also, um, I know you've mentioned uh, that there's some remappings for modules. Has there been discussion around API designs for intercepting not only static uh, module graphs, but dynamic ones as well? Uh, the, the main discussions of that have been uh, in these SES meetings uh, with you. I mean, the, that this, this um, all of the times when we explored what those APIs for doing a, a, a code-based mapping, for having the mapping under control of code, uh, were uh, discussions with you. Uh, what we're currently targeting as a interim step is the compartment API that comes from Modable because it has the expressiveness that we initially need, 
uh, and because they actually have it working. So it's an interesting uh, target. They have working and there's tests. So they provide as an argument when you create a compartment, uh, they provide a static uh, mapping table there. Uh, but the kind of API that you've shown us during these sessions, where there's two procedural hooks, uh, is much more where we want to go to. And you saw some of that reflected in, in Michael's presentation earlier about the steps we've taken towards modules where there was a uh, load uh, function in the options bag to evaluate. And uh, that probably should be more like the, the, the two argument API uh, that you showed us where there is a uh, first class unforgeable capability that represents a loaded module identity. But, but we, we haven't gotten to where uh, that's the main engineering issue yet. That's probably, I would expect that that's where we're going to end up. We would still want to be able to express simple remappings declaratively, whether we do that on top of the operational mechanism or not, uh, because the output of the Tofu tool will just give us simple static rewiring that we want to be able to run in such a way where that's the source of most of the rewirings that we do. And I should mention that uh, you know, in the browser, uh, there's this W3C import map thing that has similar declarative rewiring information. Some of it's actually you know, quite well designed in terms of how they factor out common remappings. Uh, so as we proceed to define a declarative format, we should, I think, seek to not be gratuitously different than the existing browser import maps, but we have to do something that's suitable for our security goals. Anybody else? Okay, I will. Exit that presentation. And So uh, should I, um, does any, any, anybody want to uh, discuss anything about modules or should I just uh, roll forward to do the uh, infix, infix bank presentation? So I would like to note that uh, due to uh, some problems with performance, we're probably stuck abandoning quarantining process and buffer. Um, the deopt we're getting uh, causes an order of magnitude loss in performance, even in uh, things that don't go through uh, the contextual checks. Um, V8 just uh, refuses to optimize a scope with that particular kind of check in it. Okay. Well, uh, it's not uh, for SES purposes, given that we, you know, um, for SES purposes, this is no more than a minor annoyance because the compartment mechanism gives us the ability to censor or virtualize those at little cost anyway. And can you, the, you want to transfer the power into here? Power, power cord. Okay. Get low on battery. Okay. Let's share this here. Yeah.
just have eight minutes left. Oh, 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 uh, yes, I didn't realize how much time had passed. Uh, it's not worth starting this one. Um, yeah, so if there's still interest next week, I can do this one next week. Um, um, yeah, uh, by the way, uh, Daria, welcome back. Uh, I do want to point out that our functor is itself a pure function, the functor and the module rewrite. Okay. So that we can have multiple instances of the same static module record. You can have multiple instances of that function, which are modules that are completely isolated from each other and that are wired up by different policies. Wasn't that the case before as well? Uh, it was always the intention. Uh, we did not have, I suppose it was always the case with the rewrites that we were exploring. Uh, now that we have a working rewrite, it's, it's good that we still have that. But you're right, it was, al it was always the case. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, um, I propose that uh, we adjourn. And see you all next time. All right, see ya.